Hey guys, today should be really cool. I'm talking with Zoltan Schubert, who is a marine welder fitter, so he's working with metal all the time. He's also a martial artist and a longtime knife aficionado. So I wanted to pick your brain, Zoltan, about the different kinds of metal that we're dealing with with knives, and then maybe some ideas about different kinds of folding knives. Is, is it, that okay with you today? Sounds good. Uh, Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak, uh, uh, Stefan. And I uh, hope we have a lot of fun with this video. So, so explain go ahead. it to me like I'm five. What are the different kinds of steel that you have? Like just the broad categories of steel that you might see in different kinds of knives. Everything from the super cheap ones to the thousand dollar, two thousand dollar blades. Right. Well, the first, the first two categories everyone's going to come across on the face of it is carbon steel knives and stainless steel knives. Okay. And for the most part, in the, in the common marketplace right now, you're going to find a whole bunch of different stainless steel knives. So what is a stainless steel? A stainless steel has elements in it that actually inhibit or slow down the process of oxidization. Okay. That's, that's what stainless steel, and, and actually if you look at the name carefully and think about it, it's stainless, it's not stain proof. Right. There's very few stainlesses that are truly rust proof. There are a few, but they're, they're very, very few and far between. So those are the two basic categories when you're looking at steels in particular that you're gonna come across in the marketplace. And a carbon steel is just steel without that, it's iron and carbon without right. those extra elements. A carbon steel is essentially a working steel that has carbon at a very high level and the high level of, of, of carbon in it allows it to be hardened very easily and resharpened or tooled very easily. Okay. But the disadvantage to the high level of carbon is the lack of other elements that inhibit rust and carbon is the element that will rust fastest. Okay. So we've got carbon steel on one end mm -hmm. and stainless steel on the other. Are That's there any right. other categories that we should be looking at? Well, tool steels are a high carbon stainless steel. They're essentially right in the middle, but they're leaning on the carbon side. And that's uh, a sweet spot that some knife makers favor. That might be uh, a D2 or there's other elements and names that you can, you can look for. But tool steels are, as the name suggests, used for a, high, a heavy industry. You, you'd often find dies in, in, in hydraulic presses and shears right. uh, used out of tool steel. And they're a, they're a formation of some of the best of both elements. But there is some disadvantages as well when it comes to knives. What's the disadvantage there? Uh, tool steels, although they are still uh, a stainless steel, they're so high on carbon, they're almost a, a full carbon steel, they, they still will rust. Like you have to take care of them, you can't leave them out in the elements. If you're close to salt water, that is a disadvantage to these steels. And on the benefit side, uh, a D2 for example, is an extremely high on edge retention. So once the edge is cut into that steel and it's sharp, it's gonna hold that edge under some pretty bad abuse, much longer than some of the softer stainlesses or even, uh, even a low-grade carbon. All right. So what makes a steel soft or hard? Well, it depends on the element construction, but it's not just the steel itself when, it's, when it comes out of the foundry. It's also the way the, work, the workman fashions the steel. If they give it the right temper, they're actually maximizing the potential of that steel. So if you take a, like again, go to tool steel. If you take a tool steel, it has certain properties that could be brought out of the steel through the working process. If so when you say tempered, working process, you mean like the formation of the shape of steel? No, actually I'm talking about the tempering. Okay. So the tempering process, the annealing process, sometimes they're double tempered. These kinds of processes will actually allow that steel, a certain qualities of the steel to come out in a better way than other steels. And uh, it's a combination of the steel and inherent properties from the foundry and the maker who's, who's harnessing that steel for a reason and then bringing the properties out of it. So, so um, a maker might select a certain tool steel because they want the highest toughness and the highest edge retention and they know they're sacrificing stainless ability but they don't care because they want those other properties more. Okay. And a lot of buyers might not have those thoughts forefront in their mind when they're looking at a knife. So then take me through the tempering and annealing process, just very generally, but what happens to that? In, the case, in our case we're talking about knives, but right. I right. imagine the same thing would apply to you know, a sheet of stainless that you're using That's for construction. Right. Well, there's there's many different ways of doing this, and actually some of the more higher end stainlesses, for example, and we can talk about that maybe a little bit later, the, the dis, one of the main disadvantages to it is there's an extremely elaborate process to tempering and, and hardening that steel and working it. Sometimes they have to be sub-zero quenched before they're annealed and, and brought to a full temper, and what that means is the steel has to go undergo a number of processes to allow the molecules to line up properly. And if you don't do the process that's given to you by the foundry or the maker of the actual billet of the material, then you're not maximizing the properties you're trying to find, and it's an expensive process. If you mess up a step or if you don't have it cooled or heated at the right time, 
then the molecules will not line up appropriately and you'll have a flaw in the steel somewhere. So you're That's, lining them up by heating them, cooling them, heating right. them, cooling them. And like for example, a typical steel that a, a new maker would start with is 1095 carbon. Okay. It's a great steel, it's cheap, uh, many leaf springs and trucks are made out of this and many places in the world where steel is a very expensive commodity, a 1095 steel or a, a leaf spring from a Toyota for example is a steel that people will gravitate towards because it's available. Right. It's available. It's, it's out there. People can find it. And if you take that steel and you work it at, at a basic level, you, you anneal it, you form it, you... What do you mean by anneal? Annealing brings the steel away from whatever it was before. So a leaf spring has a spring in it and it was created to maximize the, uh, the torsion of that steel. So if you anneal it, you're bringing it up to a certain temperature and it allows it to be malleable. Okay. When it's at the annealing point, you can actually flex the steel much easier with, with the basic hand tools, hammers, that kind of thing, and you can get, you get a shape out of it. But it's not, it's not hard yet, it's, not, it's, it's extremely ductile. Once it's annealed, you can work that steel properly and get a shape, and then you have to go through the hardening and tempering process to actually get the edge hard. Okay. Because the edge will not be hard until it's tempered properly. And, and with, with ten, in the example of 1095, it's actually a relatively easy steel to temper because it's, it doesn't have some of the other elements that stainless steels have that make it very difficult to do that. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's a user-friendly steel from a maker's perspective. That's another thing that many consumers don't understand is when they're looking at a high-grade stainless or a high-grade knife, oftentimes they don't see the work and the, the difficult steps that the, the maker might have had to put into that steel to make it what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's my impression that most knives that are out there, basically mm -hmm. there's a sheet of metal and there's a stamp and they cut out the rough shape of the blade and then they sharpen it and temper it yep. and sell it. Is that correct? Uh, when it comes to folding knives specifically, they use, uh, many, many folding knife companies use the stock removal method and that means that the billet comes in a flat sheet, they stamp out thousands of these, these sheets into the shape of the, uh, the rough shape of the blade they take that material over to a, a grinding device or a grinding station and they grind all the profiles into the edge. So the, the, the knife shape looks like what you're about to get from the store, but it's not tempered yet. The inherent values of the steel are still there, but they're not maximized yet. The stock removal method cuts the blank down to the profile, and then you take that piece and you go to the tempering station and then everything else happens there. That's really where the magic happens. And if it's a good company and they stand by their products, then You'll, you'll, at the end of the day, you'll have a good quality knife because it has the, the right steel and the right processes put to it. Okay. So what are other ways of making a knife? Well, a, lot, a much older way is to hand forge a knife. And that means, like in, again, in the 1095 case, you have a billet of material. It's raw billet. It gets heated up and put onto an anvil. The heating up brings the steel close to the annealing temperature or at the annealing temperature, so it's easier to work. So it's and glowing red hot at this it's point. It's glowing red. It's... it's all the slag and the, and the crust has been melted off of it. It's now just a pure billet of material. It goes under an anvil and, and a craftsman works it with a hammer. And essentially what the craftsman is doing is he's taking the hammer and he's, he's crushing the molecules together with his, physically with his tools. And at the same time, he's using his hammer very, very carefully to create the shape of what he's making. That's a long process. It's, it takes time. It takes a high level of skill often. And if it's done incorrectly, or if the timing of the heating and the hammering is not, not proper, then you end up with a knife that's either not to its full potential, or is so hard that it's become, it's become brittle and will crack under heavy use. Okay. So if I wanted to get a hand-forged mm -hmm. knife, what would I be looking at? Like, what kind of the price range to start for that? Uh, it's, that's a tough, it's a tough question to answer. A lot of makers are really, it's a very competitive market, but... In the folding, in the folding categories, I, I guess folding is mostly yeah, uh, stock removal, like you said. Exactly, and I mean uh, a hand forged folding knife is typically typically going to be Damascus because it's desired in that category, mm -hmm. and it's very expensive. You're looking at over eight hundred dollars often. Not as a rule, there's many makers that make a, a plain material, non Damascus, that are in the four and five hundred dollar range, and that's on the face of it a pretty good value considering the work that's put into that knife over a uh, production knife. Okay. Now, when you say Damascus, I've mm -hmm. seen Damascus steel, and mm -hmm. it's beautiful, it's mm -hmm. wavy. Yeah. What is it? What's, how's that different from regular steel? Damascus, like, we're just doing the Damascus, tour of steel right now. Yes, Damascus is a really, uh, it's a really interesting material, and there's many types of Damascus. I'm not an expert on Damascus, but I have friends that, that forge it themselves, and I've learned a lot from them. Uh, Damascus is a material that's not one, it's many materials, and it's, 
it's forge welded together into a billet. So instead of buying the, the material in, in one blank or, or a slab, you're getting multiple slabs of material or you're using shapes of material like uh, wire cable or I knew, I knew one guy who actually used fish hooks and you might even find this on the internet where a guy uses fish hooks out of stainless steel and he puts fish hooks into a, uh, a pipe of mild steel and he adds carbon steel and what he does is he heats the entire ingot of metal down to melt pure, pure impurities out and then he forges that into a, a billet. Including the, the mild including steel the pipe. Including the fish hooks, including the mild steel pipe, that's okay. right. So what, it, what, he's, what he's got at the end of the day is he has a, uh, a layer cake of different mm -hmm. elements. The benefits to that are you have an extremely beautiful billet when it's cut and etched at the end of the day. And if you are very careful and you, and you know what you're going for, you can actually have a, dist uh, um, a differentially tempered knife. So you have a softer spine and a harder edge, or a harder core and a really hard edge and then a softer spine, depending on what you're trying to make. So it's that layered steel like the Japanese katana. It's very similar to the Japanese technology. There, there is some differences. Um, often the layering is coarser in most Damascus on purpose mm -hmm. because they want to maximize the differences in, in texture and the differences in elements. And it is a very aesthetically pleasing thing too. Like if you see a well-made Damascus knife, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Uh, it takes many, many hours to do it right. And there's, it's very easy to make a mistake. Okay. So are there any other questions I should be asking you about the steel manufacture process just at a 10,000 foot level for, for personal knives? Um, a, really good, a really good question is, it's maybe not on the, on the, the steel manufacturing process, but on the assembly and the, uh, the overall finish of a knife is often QC or, or quality control. Um, every once in a while you get a good maker that's really well liked in the marketplace and they, they make a good product or the design is really outstanding. But you, like every third or fourth knife, you'll have a, a small de defect or an error. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to pay attention to because from the consumer's perspective, you're always trying to find the, the balance between quality and a good, a good buy. If that particular manufacturer, I don't want to name any names or anything, but if you find a manufacturer who makes a good quality design, but then you know, you, you, your, your knife and your buddy's knife is the same knife and he's got a better quality or a worse quality one, that might um, highlight some mistakes they might make that you can't see in the metal tempering process, for example, or the assembly process. Do they x-ray it to see if there are any flaws inside no, the metal? No, probably not. Yeah. Uh, th there's too many knives being made in, 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 a, in a given uh, factory. I'm sure they wouldn't x-ray them. Uh, what, they might, what they might do, and this is probably company to company, I have no inside knowledge of this, but I assume company to company, they would take one knife out of a hundred or one knife out of a thousand and they'd pressure test it to destruction. Mm -hmm. So they'd take a knife and they'd either Cut, in half. Know, thousands of pieces of material or they would flex flex the knife until it breaks or you know do a point test or something like that uh, most knives uh, the like it, let's say the whole sheet has a thousand blades in it and they'd stamp them all out they'd probably take one of the stamped blades and put it into a rockwell test and that's why in North America at least when you look at a knife and you and it, it's advertised to you they have one specification in there that's really common to find that's the Rockwell hardness mm -hmm. so you say you know 57 to 60 or 55 to 58 that's an important number and we can talk about that later but they get that number from stamping with a little ball detent the material that the blades are made out of and seeing how far it goes yes. in. yes and they measure the depth and then they give a, a rating of Rockwell hardness to the material so how hard do you want your knife to be I mean, you'd think it's super good hard, question. it would stay super That's sharp. That's a very good question. But... And actually, uh, it's... I think that question is better answered when in relationship to the end user's um, use for the knife. Um, so there's no one perfect knife for everybody's ultimate? Unfortunately not. That's the news. You know, okay. everyone likes to think that they're looking for the holy grail, the one knife that can cut everything or that can do everything. Um, I don't think there, that exists. I think that there's many knives that do many things well and a few knives that do a few things exceptionally well but there's no one knife that can do everything perfectly. So, so give me an example of a knife that can do one thing well. I, like I'm thinking fishing okay. knife, right? Okay. It's super thin, but you're not going to use it to as your generalized survival knife right. because it's so going to snap. I'll, I've, I brought some knives today, and I think I'll bring one out just to show everyone. This is, um, this is an offering from Spyderco. It's actually a really good knife. It's called the Spyderco Manix 2. This is the lightweight version. It's made out of a uh, CTS BD1 stainless steel. It's got an axis lock and a pocket clip. And I'll show this to Stefan here. He can take a look at that while I talk. It's, I've used this knife quite a bit. I don't, I don't uh, review things that I don't use. 
I, and I have a quite a large collection and, and most of the knives that I buy I use for all kinds of reasons. Um, I bring this one out because you mentioned fishing. This, uh, there's, there's a number of things you might look for if you're looking for a knife for a specific application. And in that particular application, what you probably are looking for is corrosion resistance and a very, very thin, precise edge because the things you're cutting are soft mm -hmm. and they're slippery. And they're going to be, you know, you're going to have to hang on to things. You, you want a nice, precise blade to do the work you're doing for that particular application. So not only is the steel good for that kind of an application, but the blade design is also quite good for that specific yeah. kind of application. Yeah, it's quite thin. And it's you're very, not, very thin. You're not trying to you know, pry a truck out of the ditch with it. Certainly not. And, and I guess that's, that's the thing about many knives is uh, there's it, the design, the steel, and the size and weight and cost all lend themselves to certain applications. So, for example, fishing, you might, you might err more on a corrosion-resistant steel than a less corrosion-resistant steel if you're on salt water, for example. Right. Now, what about, since this is a self-defense channel, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. about a self-defense knife? What kind of steel mm -hmm. would you suggest for a self-defense knife? I guess there's, well, there's a steel and there's a design, yes. those are two different things. And I mean, if we're just going to talk steel, I think the one thing I would say is pick a steel that you know you can sharpen well. And if you're not good at hand sharpening, or if you need uh, the help of a jig or an assembly, you probably want to pick a relatively mild stainless steel or a steel that's known to be easy to sharpen because you're going to be sharpening it a lot. You know, sorry, we haven't defined yet mild. That's true. But people say mild steel, so just that's true. tell the people. Well, uh, basic mild steel is not good for knife making. I'll just say that right now. When I said mild steel, I'm referring to a milder stainless steel within the knife category of steels. So all to, to, to be perfectly clear, all the stainless steels we're going to talk about today are hard steels, and some of them are very hard steels. But in the category of, of stainless steels in the knife spectrum, the milder ones are the ones that are easiest to work with your hands. You'll be able to get an edge faster. So faster. somewhat softer. Somewhat softer, yeah. Right. So they'd be within the 55, 57 Rockwell hardness areas. They wouldn't get close to 60. Okay. You know, 60, even 59 and up is pretty, pretty darn hard. And the difficulty level to sharpen or resharpen a knife like that will, will uh, ramp up very quickly if you're not used to that kind of a steel. So for easy sharpening, what would be your Rockwell hardness? A Rockwell hardness 55 to 58. Um, decent corrosion resistance, not too heavy on the on the carbon. And you're looking for, a good example would be AUS 8, VG10, um, uh, 8, 8R, 8CR MOV, I believe is a version of, of uh, AUS 8. And I know I'm throwing a lot of yeah. numbers out there, but essentially what these are, are commonly available high-grade stainless steels. They're not super steels. They're not expensive. A typical um, knife with the uh, an AUS eight would run, run you about sixty bucks. That's it. So when you say AUS eight, is mm -hmm. that a manufacturer's sort of code name yes. for that steel? It's yes, not exactly. some universal. No, that system. that is actually a designation that would be stamped right on the blade of the steel. When I brought that last knife out, I said it's uh, CTS BD one, I believe. That's actually similar to AUS-8. It's a slightly different steel. I believe it's a carpenter steel, if my memory serves me correctly. And it has similar attributes as AUS-8. Okay. Yeah. So then, uh, th that was a fairly mild steel? Fairly that was, soft. A, that was a, um, a mild to medium stainless okay. with, a, with an emphasis on the stainless properties. Okay. So it sharpens up well. It's very good against uh, you know, water resistance. And if you carry it close to your body or if you're around water a lot, It'll do fairly well. As you are being in a, right. working in a marine environment. Exactly. And uh, like there's, there's knives I'll use at work exclusively because of my environment that I work in and because of the things that I'm cutting the most. And then there's other knives that I would never take to work because they're not for that environment or they wouldn't perform to the same level. And there's risks involved. I'd damage the knife if I took them there. Okay. So let's, uh, we went off on a little tangent there. I'm we sure did, it's the, yeah. not, the, not the last one either. So I had asked you what a good steel was yes. for self-defense knives, and you said something yes. that's easy to sharpen. Yes, and I say, I say that primarily because you want your self-defense knife to be sharp. Mm -hmm. And if you're carrying it a lot for self-defense, it's probably a knife you're carrying for other reasons as well, not right. just self-defense. So you want the knife to be useful to you and to be ready to go whenever you need it to be ready to go. Um, if it's a really hard knife or if it's a really hard, difficult knife to sharpen, it might not be a good self-defense knife unless you're not using it for anything else. Right. And that's just the one caveat I'll throw in there because if you pack a knife that's for self-defense but you're using it for your letter opening and this and that and, and it's not 
up to the task when you need to use it for self-defense, it's less than what it's for. Right. And that's not a good thing. Yeah. I, I think if you're oh, if you're a complete knife fanatic mm -hmm. and you yeah. go, there's no problem sharpening the super hard steel, right. you're probably not watching this video. Maybe not. Yeah. But the interesting thing about that is, uh, unlike many other things, many other products, knives are something that people collect all over the mm -hmm. place. And I've found, I, I have quite a few, I have plenty of knives that are very, very good, and I still will buy a cheaper knife if the design attracts me or if there's something about it that is unique that I like. Okay. So in the, in the knife community, I think there's a lot of people that are really interested in a great number of categories of knives and might still buy another knife, even if they have very high-end knives. Sure. You know. Well, show me another one, and let's go through the properties speaking, of that. Speaking of high-end knives, we've got a, uh, a Kershaw knife. This is a uh, zero tolerance. It has an assisted, assisted blade with a flipper, and the flipper just means the blade protrudes from the spine of the knife and acts on a torsion bar. When you press it here, it opens with an assist inside the knife. Uh, uh, I'm not sure of the specific laws in the States. I, I, would, I would suspect that it's legal everywhere except for New York and California because they have similar laws when it comes to switchblades and, and butterfly knives, but I don't know uh, to be to Consult be Consult your lawyer. Yes, so <laughs> user specific. If you're there, you tell us. But the reason why I bring this knife out when we talk about high grade stainless is because this knife uses an LMAX steel, which is actually considered a super steel. And all these grades of steels typically are stamped right on the blade at some point, and this, in this case is on the, on the, uh, the top inside, so the, the metal side and you've got the logo of the manufacturer right there, zero tolerance. So I'll let you handle that knife. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good knife. It's got, an, it's got a great size, uh, and the, the design is very robust. Uh, I want to put some emphasis on the point here. Uh, this point is, is swept up. It's not as fine as the other knife I showed you. It's got a very, very thick spine out to the point, which is unusual. That's something you have to look for if you want that as a feature. And the reason why this, I picked this knife against the other knife because it's a good example of a knife that's going in a completely different direction for its design. It's got very high retention. It's a lot heavier. It's made out of a heavier material. Sorry, when you say retention, what do you mean? When I say retention, I'm talking about when it fits in the hand, the way it fits in the hand. Um, it, with the flipper being where it is, it's, it literally locks the hand from going forward and it stops your hand from doing anything overtly dangerous. From sliding up the blade. By yes. The and that, that makes this knife, it lends this knife to a martial mind more easily. Um, anything piercing related or, or slashing related, the ergonomics are excellent. So that's, that's actually not a steel, a steel type thing you're looking for, that's a design thing. And when it comes to a self-defense knife, it's the combination of all the things that I think make the knife really good for self-defense. Okay. Uh, show me another one. Sure. So that's a good example of a high grade knife. This is a good example of what we talked about a little bit earlier, and that's a, that's a tool steel knife. This is actually a completely different design. Uh, it has D2 tool steel. Uh, this is a dagger, a dagger profile, and it has a liner lock. Now this is also a skeletonized knife, very, very thin, G, G10 handles. This is made by Ontario Knife Company, and uh, it's very, very lightweight. Uh, this is a great, a great example of a knife you would not want to use for work because it's so thin and, and flexible and, and lightweight. If you put a lot of torque on it with your hand on something really heavy like wood or, or other material, you could actually damage this knife pretty easily. And what is a D2 designation? Uh, D2 refers to the steel uh, element that was actually made out of and it, and it has a very, very high carbon content. So what this knife will not be good at is rust, rust resistance. Uh, and this, this knife does come with a coating, so it's a little bit better than non-coated for that reason, but it's still not impervious to rusting. So you have to keep an eye on these knives, you have to clean the edge from time to time, and if they're wet, you got to wipe them down. But on the other hand, easy to sharpen. Right. Well, no, not necessarily easy no. to sharpen. They're very, you said it's carbon? Uh, it's carbon, but it's a tool steel, so it's, it's, in, it's in that weird middle place. And being uh, D2, it's very, very tough. So once it is sharpened, it'll stay sharp for okay. a longer period of time. So See, I was under the impression that carbon steel was easy to sharpen yes. and stainless was harder to sharpen, but you're telling me that's, uh, that, that's, that's erroneous. That's true. That's true. Uh, carbon steels, pure carbon steels, are easy to sharpen because they don't have the little elements of, of chromium, molybdenum, vanadium, and, and the different elements that make the steel stainless. So what happens when you're shaving the steel off with a sharpening stone, you're not having the other abrasive elements resist that cutting. But with a tool steel, you have those elements in there, but you also have high carbon levels. Okay. 
So the high carbon levels in this knife allow it to rust a little bit easier than a stainless steel, and you have to keep an eye on that. But you also get the benefit of a very, very, very thin edge. And unlike uh, a mild stainless, for example, you can have a very thin edge at a very hard level, and it retains that, that hardness and that cutting ability without actually uh, being damaged as easily, because it's so thin and hard, right? Okay. So there's a distinct advantages and disadvantages to a knife like that. I think this, this manufacturer picked a really good steel. Okay. Well, you must be out of knives by now. Not quite, actually. I picked a really good knife for you, yeah. actually, and this is a rescue knife. This is actually made by Benchmade. It's called the Triage. It's, a, it's a new favorite. It uses an access lock system. It has a number of features, made it a G10 handle, and it uses N680 bowler steel, which is notoriously good for corrosion resistance. It's a very, very easily reten re retained knife. It's got a very uh, high traction handle. Uh, you can open it one-handed. It includes a glass breaker and as well as a, um, a first aid seat belt cutter or clothing, a clothing cutter in the handle this way. This does not lock though. Mm -hmm. Um, knives like this are very user specific. So it, this is called the triage for a reason. It's a rescue knife. It's got an extremely durable tip, mm -hmm. half serrated blade. But not uh, a very sharp tip, so it's no. hard to stab the person you're trying That's to, uh, to help. That's true. And, and this is exactly um, the point about design is the, the steel is great for corrosion resistance. It's, it's okay for edge retention. It's okay for, for heavy use because of the design, but it's a knife you probably have to sharpen more than the LMAX, uh, the Kershaw uh, Z, uh, ZT. That's going to hold its edge longer, you can use it harder, and it'll be a little bit more robust in the edge holding ability. What are your thoughts about the serrated portions? Of, I mean, obviously, that makes cutting mm. through a non-tensioned rope or something like that mm -hmm. much easier. That's right. But it's harder to sharpen. Well, serrations are kind of a... Uh, they've gone out of style lately, and it's too bad because they are very useful. And serrations are, are a, a user-specific option that you pick if you're, if you're a specific kind of user. If you're on the water, you pretty much always have serrations. Um, the, the big disadvantage I find when I talk to other users that are less savvy with sharpening equipment is they have a hard time sharpening them or they can't sharpen them at all and they just use the knife until it's dull or they don't like it anymore, they throw it away and they buy another one. That's really the wrong attitude because they're not that hard to sharpen if you have the right tools. There's a lot of information on the web to sharpen serrations. I'm sure, I'm sure there's many websites out there. but. I'd like to encourage people that have serrated knives to, to look into that because the benefits of having a serrated knife are really incredible. Um, it's, it's, you have many angles cutting at the same time when you're going through a fibrous material. Things like jean if in, a, in, a, in a rescue circumstance, it's, it's amazing to have. Rope, seat belts, cloth, even cardboard, serrations are going to do a better job of ripping through a, a piece of equipment or, or material faster than a mild steel. Or, pardon me, just a, a plain, plain edge. Right. The, the big disadvantage is in resharping, though. Okay. Uh, any other knives with you today? <laughs> oh, look. Yes, yes, I actually have a few. Uh, I, think, I think this is another knife, and this is actually one of, uh, this is a second Spyderco I'm bringing out, and this is a Spyderco Paramilitary 2. It uses a, uh, a thumb hole opening here in the blade. Uh, there's many different ways of opening this. This is a very sophisticated knife, if, I, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, I could go through all the features, but I'm not trying to sell you the knife. It's been a favorite. Uh, many people like it out there, and if you're a collector or a knife user, you probably know about this knife already. It uses CPM S30V. Now, the neat thing about this knife, and specifically the blade steel that it's using, is it's a crucible blade steel. Uh, also, the ZT is a crucible blade steel, and these are considered very, very high-level stainless steels. When I say that, I mean the steel is not sold in a, in a blank. It's actually, uh, when they forge the steel, they use powdered metal shavings, and they they compress it in a crucible and they actually forge the steel with, with this compression technique. It's, it's, it's very, very sophisticated. And what that does for the end user is it gives the end user a product, a steel product, that is metallurgically pure. There is no flaw inside the steel. It is absolutely 100% dense, packed steel into that billet, which gives the manufacturer a benefit because they can cut the edge very, very thin without risks of flaws or, or impurities messing up that final profile of the knife. But the, and the user gets a knife that's both extremely hard, more or less corrosion resistant. It's not maybe as corrosion resistant as a bowler or a different stainless, but it's very, very high. And it's also easy to resharpen. Many people have said or, or like to say that these, this category of steels, crucible steels, are the, the best steels. And 
arguably they are the they're, they're very very popular they're, they're a little bit more expensive because they're more expensive to manufacture and to work with the tools that the manufacturers use but they're great steels you know and the performance shows that out and I've had this, this this particular knife for many many years it's been great okay so as we're wrapping up here just what are some of the mistakes that you see enthusiastic beginners make when they're buying knives right they, they want to um, get a good knife yeah. You, you already mentioned like the one knife to rule them all. That's fallacy. right. Yeah. Uh, no, Lord so of the Rings will not apply yeah. here, yeah. sadly. So we put that one to bed. That's but right. What are some other mistakes? I think a lot of guys fall on, fall in love with the design purely because it looks mean or it looks cool or it, it you know it attracts them in some way. The colors right or whatever, and it, it can be kind of like kid in the candy shop when you see a whole bunch of knives laying out there and you go, oh, I like these, I like these five. Um, try and refrain from buying a knife on impulse and try considering why someone designed the knife for what it's for. It's like, it's, I, every single blade I showed you just now was radically different from the last blade, and I wouldn't use any one of those knives for every purpose. Uh, the very last knife, for example, had an extremely thin tip. Um, great utility EDC knife, not a good hard use camping knife. Hmm. You stick that into a piece of wood and you take the knife out wrong, you could break the tip off. So consider what you're using the knife for. Consider what kind of primary designs and benefits the steel is going to give you and then couch your couch your budget within those parameters and you'll be successful there's a lot of great products out there there's a lot of great manufacturers we live in a great time to be buying a knife right now so that's good so and then what conversely sort of on the other side of the counter mm. what are the kind of the, the bullshit that you hear from people mm. selling knives mm. to people with you know a couple hundred bucks in their pocket Oftentimes the super steels are, are marketed as so much better than every other steel that the salesman will say, well, this has the crucible steel and you need to have that if you want the best knife. That's not entirely true. Um, if you need a very tough, durable, sophisticated steel because you're, you're using the knife extremely hard, then you might want to invest in a steel like that over a, a, a medium stainless like an AUS-8 or a VG-10 perhaps. But if you're just using the knife once in a while, once a week, maybe once a month, and you're not cutting much, and it's a, it's a maybe I might need this knife in the future and I'm carrying it around, you might not need to spend as much money and you can save a lot of money if you buy a well-designed average steel knife. Mm -hmm. There's specific knife steels I'd stay away from and 440A um, would be one of them. Okay, so why that? Because that's probably the most common uh, type of steel that I've seen on yes. know, medium to cheap. Yes, and 440 steel has, there's three categories roughly, C, B, and A. And A is sort of a, it's definitely a lower grade. There's also 420, which is related to it, and it's even lower than that. And knives that are in this category, um, you, you need to be suspicious of them because they're, it's an older steel, it's, it used to be well respected, and there's many makers that will buy it because it's very, very easily available and it's not as hard to work. But it also means that they could just finish it off quickly and get it out there. Um, a 440C is the one example that is a better quality steel, and that's a, it's a very sophisticated stainless. It's not a super steel, but it's been known to be used by custom makers. So you have, like, there's no one type to stay away from forever, but I would suggest looking at the Rockwell hardness. If, if you need a, uh, a user-friendly steel, keep it, keep it under 60, keep it un like in the 58 range and consider the design and also consider the sharpening device.